Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's on. And that's a lesson for be careful what you put on social media. <laughs> okay, so my talk today is on everything I know about blue whales, um, which really is, is a, a, an attempt at an overview of the status of every population of blue whales in the world that we know something about. Um, and much of this has been um, based on work that other people have done that I have stolen, as I always do in my work, um, and put into my models to get a little bit of extra information out of. So often I'll take people's survey data and put them in a model and come up with an assessment uh, of status. Um, but blue whales, um, who knows anything about blue whales? Blue whales, yeah, you know, they are the biggest of the whales, right? You know, everybody hopefully knows that, the biggest whale in the world. Maybe you also know that they are the largest animal ever to be on the face of the earth, larger than any of the dinosaurs. Um, in fact, they're so large that just their tongue is bigger than an adult elephant, all right? It's so big that a blue whale heart is big enough that over there, that little one thing over there is a five gallon bucket in one of the valves of the heart of a blue whale, which is big enough for a toddler <laughs> to crawl through, okay? And if you ever encounter a whale, you need to know, what it, is it a blue whale or not? Here, here is my swift identification guide. And I should say that there are many people in this room who have seen more blue whales than I have. So um, this is the best I can do. So first of all, they have a mottled gray skin, not actually technically blue. Um, they have a super, super tall blow, so there's more than six meter tall uh, blow um, with, a, with a hexacopter for scale. Um, they have a tiny little dorsal fin right near the back of the tail. Um, they have baleen plates that are completely black. Um, and if they ever roll over or you see them uh, washed up, their underside is dark. So the two whales on the left are blue whales and the one on the right is a fin whale. Um, and finally, when they surface, they seldom show their fins or their flukes. So here's a sequence of pictures of a blue whale. And if you look really, really closely, you can see the two biopsy dots flying out from the left. 
um, at about uh, uh, number 10. So you can see the well coming up. It's going at pretty much pace. The blow comes out. There's the blowhole. You notice that the blowhole looks just like a human nose. Do you look really carefully? They're already going down. We still have not seen the dorsal fin. They're already going down. Out there pops a little biopsy dot on the bottom left and another one in the middle left. Still have not seen the dorsal fin and they're gone. All right. So that's pretty, pretty common surfacing pattern. Not, they don't show their flukes, don't show their dorsal fin. They just come up and they go down again. Um, so, of course, the obvious question that the 20th century uh, nations immediately tried to answer was, how can we most efficiently kill them and turn them into margarine? <laughs> and this was true. A lot of the margarine in the mid uh, 20th century was from whales. Um, well products were used for lubricants, they were used in lighting, they were used for explosives, they were used as soap, as margarine, as fertilizer, meat, and even in World War I to prevent the gangrene of the feet of the soldiers fighting in the trenches and getting um, their, their boots full with water and mud. Um, and here is some of the, some of the uh, hope I don't trip over the mat here, some of the advertising from the US, Canadian, uh, so on, on the bottom right, well meat, this is meat, not fish, economical and excellent for, su for soups, stews, curries and roasts, recommended by the US Bureau of Fisheries. So, so yes, and then on the top left, on the, on the left side, Canadian liquid whale plant food, blue whale, organic liquid essence of the whale, okay, used all over. So I should point out that whaling for blue whales did not start at the same time it did um, in the American whaling section. So this is the Moby Dick era of whaling, 1790 to 1920-ish. Every light blue dot on that map is the noonday position of a whaling vessel for which they were able to extract the data from a logbook. Not all the logbooks are represented here of whaling vessels from the Moby Dick era. The dark blue dots are where they caught sperm whales. The red dots are right whales. The yellow dots are bowheads. The purple pinky dots are gray whales and the green ones are humpback whales. And what you can see is virtually the entire world was covered by this era of open boat whalers. But you'll notice that those species don't include fin whales, blue whales, say whales, minke whales, all of those were too fast to catch. All right. In fact, you could roughly categorize them into right whales and wrong whales. Right? The right whales, literally the right whales were the ones that didn't sink when you killed them and they were easy to catch because they didn't swim, swim away when you, when you attacked them. And in fact, you can roughly divide all the baleen whales into two groups, those ones that involve flight and those ones that involve fight. So if they're faced with orcas, the ones that do flight will just flee as quickly as they can. Indeed, minke whales, the, what some people call the rats of the sea, will abandon their calves and flee as quickly as they can and leave their calves for the orcas to take care of. Um, but similarly, uh, blue whales, say whales, fin whales, they can all, they're all adapted to swim away as quickly as they can and outpace any attacker that might go after them. On the other hand, gray whales, right whales, bowheads, humpbacks, they're all adapted to defend and be maneuverable and have powerful flukes that can attack um, attackers in turn. Um, so those are the two categories and of course blue whales were not um, attackable because they're just swam away far too quickly. That was true at least until the era of modern whaling which started in 1883 when Sven Foyn, the uh, Norwegian whaler, developed the first modern uh, uh, whaling practices. So what he figured out was that you can put an explosive tip harpoon on the back of a vessel and when it hits the whale it will kill them instantly so you don't have to worry about the whale escaping. You can put this on a vessel that allows you to pull the whale up onto the back of your vessel through a stern slipway, so you don't need to process the whale on the side. You're truly pelagic. You can go and whale wherever you want to whale. Um, you can be part of a fleet of vessels where the main big vessel is where you process all the whales, and the fleet of up to 24 catcher boats go out, fan out, and look for whales, and hunt them down and kill them. Um, 
If you're worried about your well sinking once you kill it, there's an air pump on all the vessels. You can pump it full of air, which is incidentally why if you ever see pictures of dead whales on the back of vessels, they always look super round, which is quite different to their look when they're swimming in reality, where they're often quite slender. And that's because they're pumped full of air. And finally, of course, you have to have steam-powered or diesel-powered boats to outpace a blue well, um, which can swim pretty fast. So in the era of modern whaling, this is what modern whaling looked like starting in the early, in the late 1880s, whaling in the North Atlantic. Um, by the start of the 1900s, they switched down to South Georgia and started whaling for blue whales in South Georgia. And eventually whaling spread out um, to some whaling, shore whaling stations, and then with pelagic whaling, spread out throughout the Antarctic. Um, you know, World War II catchers disappeared as all the catcher boats and uh, uh, refueling vessels went to war efforts. By the 1950s, whaling was proceeding at pace, and that was when the Soviet Union started whaling throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the world, even in places they weren't meant to whale. And by the ban on whaling in 1986, the last remaining whaling is zipping between two places in the Antarctic with Japanese whalers, which have actually just recently stopped now. So if you look at what, where total blue whale catches came from, it's immediately obvious that most of the blue whale catches were in the Antarctic. They were all, uh, all through the coast of Chile, Peru. They were off the west coast of the US, east coast of the US, up in Iceland, um, throughout around South Africa, and Namibia, Angola, around Australia, and off Japan and Russia. And if you look at the pattern of catches just in the southern hemisphere of modern whaling, you'll see that whalers shifted from the easiest to catch uh, to the most valuable, to the less valuable, to the less valuable, to the less valuable. Humpbacks were easiest to catch, blue whales were the most valuable and biggest, fin whales were the next most valuable, sperm whales were the next most valuable, say whales, and once the say whales had gone down, we were left just with minky whales. And I should point out that down there on the bottom right, that little bit of catch under minky whales, that's what we're still arguing over in terms of current commercial whaling. It's about 800 minky whales per year. So with all these catches of blue whales with a peak of more than 30,000 in one year, um, eventually, even the International Whaling Commission, which was established to ensure the orderly progression of whaling, even they recognized that there was something going on with blue whales, and they uh, uh, convened a committee of three eminent scientists, called literally the Committee of Three <laughs> Eminent Scientists, all right? Um, and that was the start of the scientific committee. They brought these in, they said, 1961, find them, tell us what's going on with the status of whale stocks. 1963, blue whales are severely depleted, almost extinct. Let's ban them. 1966, they banned catching blue whales. I should point out that these are three pretty famous people. Uh, K. Radway Allen was possibly the only person who had been the top director of three separate nations fisheries agencies, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Um, Sidney Holt, you may have heard of the Bevan Holt stock recruitment relationship. That's the Holt, and he's still alive, and he's still arguing with me on, 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 on email. <laughs> um, Doug Chapman was a University of Washington professor of mathematics, the first director of the School of Fisheries. Sorry, a, a director of the School of Fisheries. So you might think that was the point, 1966, we finally got to the point we banned catching blue whales. They can start rebuilding. Um, but a curious thing was happening at the same time. And that curious thing was that when everybody else was failing to find enough whales to make a go of commercial whaling, all the other nations, the Soviet Union was building the biggest, the five biggest factory fleets that had ever been designed. These, these had a 24 catcher vessels that would fan out in a line 200 miles wide, and they would, they would go through the ocean. If any of them found any whales, they would radio the others and they would converge and wipe them out. Okay. And nobody could figure out how they could possibly be making money by fishing during the legal whaling seasons in the legal places. And the answer was that they weren't. Um, so this is 
Uh, the top plot here is the Soviet Union during this illegal whaling uh, period, uh, showing the catches of all species on the top, and the bottom is how many of those were, were blue whales. And I should point out, the red line there is the line at 40 degrees south, below which it was legal to catch whales, above which it was illegal to catch whales. So you may notice a few of those dots above the red line. Okay, Not only were they catching whales illegally in the wrong place, they were catching them out of the open season, which was uh, at the, the start of February. They were catching them starting in November and ending in April, well before and well after. They were catching species that were banned, uh, blue whales, humpbacks, right whales. They were catching them wherever they found them. They were catching whales they were too small, illegally too small. They were catching whales that were accompanied by calves. They were pretty much um, catching whales in contravention of every single legal regulation there was governing whaling at the time. Okay. So you can imagine what a huge impact that had on blue whale stocks around the world. So having said that, let's go through and ask what we know about each individual blue whale population. So here, each color here represents um, one blue whale subspecies. So Antarctic blue whales in the south, northern blue whales north of the equator, pygmy blue whales in the Indian Ocean, um, Chilean blue whales in green, and some of these have separate, sub, um, separate populations. There are nine populations altogether denoted by the different letters. And I'm going to go through many of these and ask what is their current status now. So let's start with the biggest of them all, Antarctic blue whales. And not only do these have the largest population size, they also have the biggest individuals of the biggest species to have ever roamed the Earth, up to 100 feet long and more. So how many of them are now left? Remember that in one year, there were 31,000 caught in the Antarctic. So how many are left now? It turns out the IWC did surveys around the entire Antarctic, where all of them congregate in summer. Um, they did three circumpolar sets of surveys, it took them about 20 years, and this is how many they estimate there are. 453 in 1981, 559 in 1988, just over 2,000 right now. So given the catchers, given how many there are now, you don't even need to do any math to t for, for me to tell you that they're in a bad state, but we do the math anyway, because that's what I do. Okay. So I'm just going to say the word Bayesian model so you can all be like, oh, Bayesian model, ah! <laughs> okay. All right. At the end of the day, all, of, all this model is, is a logistic model. Right? Everybody remember logistic models? So that n is the number of individuals. So we start off with the number of individuals at carrying capacity. Pre, we can say pre-whaling numbers are carrying capacity, k. Every year the number is equal to the number they were last year, plus some rate of increase, r, times the number they were last year, times some density-dependent term, that 1 minus n over k is the density-dependent term. If your numbers are close to carrying capacity, you won't increase at all. If your numbers are already really, really low, close to zero, you'll increase at the maximum rate of R. And then you subtract the catches off the end. So that's the model. It's a logistic model. If you've heard of a logistic model, that's all this is with some fancy way of getting uncertainty through a Bayesian model. Okay? And we fit it to all the data that's available. We put priors and all the stuff. We do all the fancy Bayesian stuff. And we end up with this. That this is the estimated proportion of the whale population caught every year uh, from the start of the whaling in 1904 up until the actual year when the Soviets stopped illegal whaling, which is 1973, when they put international observers on board the vessels. Um, every one of those data points that's above that sustainable rate, that little gray dashed line, is unsustainable. So every year, from 1928 to 1973, the catches were unsustainable, including all those years after blue whale catches were banned. Purely, the Soviet Union catches alone were unsustainable at that point. You'll notice that the only reprieve they have was during World War II. That's because there were no boats left. They requisitioned the catches. They requisitioned the oil, uh, the oil boats. They requisitioned 
the processing boats, all of them went into the war effort. Almost all of them were sank during, the, during World War II. Um, okay, so if that's harvest rate, what does the population trend look like? Everyone take a deep breath. They started at 239,000. They went down to 360. In other words, we got rid of 99.85% of them. We left with 0.15% um, by the time we got down to the bottom. So the question is, okay, what on earth motivated these whalers to catch almost down to the very last one of these blue whales? Because um, in some sense, if you think about it, if there are only 360 blue whales left in the Antarctic, does it really make sense to send five expeditions down there, each with 24 catcher vessels, to catch that few number of blue whales? The answer is no, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, in other words, is extinction really profitable if you're just going after blue whales? And the answer is no, it's not. It's not at all profitable. There's no way. It's no matter how you dice it, it was not profitable at all to just go after blue whales. But they weren't doing that. They were going after fin whales. So by the time the blue whales had gone down to low numbers, they were really targeting fin whales. Really, by 1950, it wasn't a blue whale industry at all. It was a fin whale industry. They had switched. They were making all their money off catching fin whales. And if they happened to find a blue whale on the side, they would opportunistically take it out, all right? Because blue whales are still worth much more than fin whales. And it turns out that the more you look at this kind of mode of hunting, the more you realize how common it is. How common it is for one species to be rendered nearly extinct, and then for hunters, for whalers, for trappers, for loggers to go and switch to another species that they exploit, and whenever they find the more valuable first one, to take it out when they find it. And in, in fact, um, we wrote a really cool paper, three of us, three of us had come across this mode independently, and when the first one did, I sent him an email, and I said, hey, you know, we should write a paper on this. And he said, yeah, yeah, sure, and we, we didn't. Um, <laughs> but when the third person wrote his paper on it, and had a throwaway paragraph, the two of us contacted him and said, you know, we really should write a paper on this now, because now there are three of us. And so we got together, we wrote a paper finding all the examples of this we can find, and this ranges from uh, poachers taking out rhinos in Zambia, which did go extinct in Zambia. Um, what they were doing is, when the rhinos went down to low levels, they switched over to elephants. As long as there are enough elephants to poach, you'll keep on, keep on going and poaching. And if you find a rhino, they're worth much more, you'll take the rhino out. You see the same thing when you go fishing. You see the same thing when you take out sea cucumbers. Um, to the bottom left picture there is a sea cucumber. Turns out that sea cucumber fisheries are another case of this where some of them um, look much more beautiful than others, and they're worth much, much more. They'll catch them, they'll dry them, sell them in Hong Kong for exorbitant prices. Um, and the same thing is true there. You'll switch from one species to a more abundant species worth less while still catching the more abundant one on the side. It's true of mahogany, true of blue whales, true of babarusa wild pigs in Indonesia, and, um, and so on. So, so is there any hope for our Antarctic blue whales? So this was the pattern I just showed you, and the, you might ask the question, well, what is happening now? Are they coming back? Are they doing badly? What does the model say about current rates? And the answer is, there's some good news. If you zoom really far, far into that little bit over there, you can see that they are actually increasing, and they're increasing quite rapidly. It'll only take another 50 or 60 years to recover at this rate. Okay. But where are they now? And what is happening? And here I get to show, show off the most beautiful figure in the whole presentation. I'm, <laughs> Daniel's smiling because the bottom figure is his. <laughs> it really is the most beautiful figure in the whole presentation. Um, this is um, data we have. Uh, from 1965 onwards from the Japanese scouting vessels, um, and they, they expend an enormous amount of effort. Each one of those gray squares in the top panel is a square with um, some sighting effort. Um, the places with 
The yellow and the different colors are where blue whales are sighted. And what you can see is in the Antarctic area, that's the bottom bit, there are very, very few sightings. But in the northern area where the other subspecies, pygmy blue whales, occurs, there are much more sightings in the most recent year. And you can see how that division between the two is driven by the different um, uh, oceanographic fronts that seem to pretty neatly divide where the two subspecies um, interact. Um. <clears throat> we wrote a paper, Daniel and myself, and a, a whole very large number of other people, uh, which looked at all of the sightings, all of the strandings, the acoustic records, um, any discovery marks, and the catches in old times and now. And I should say that when you're talking about 14,000 days of search effort, and 7 million kilometers of search effort, that's a fair, fairly large amount of effort. The blue dots and, and symbols here are after whaling ended. The red dots are before uh, and during the era of whaling. What you see is actually there doesn't seem to be a lot of places where they were completely extirpated. It seems to be wherever there were blue whales, there still are blue whales. Um, one of the neat things that came out of this and just totally peripheral to this talk, but I like to talk about it. I said, look at this pattern over here, and you can see how there are whales around Australia, and there's sort of scattered dots going up into Indonesia. And it seems pretty obvious to me that those blue whales are migrating past Australia and going to Indonesia. And what was very satisfying to see was when they finally were able to satellite tag blue whales off Australia, they followed almost exactly this compilation of all of the past data that we had found. It was a very satisfying moment when, when, when your prediction actually comes true in science. It does happen. Hold out hope. Now, when I presented these results about the blue whale population in the Antarctic, and I said, well, they're, they're increasing, they're, doing, they're, they're at least going to recover, um, one of the first reactions I got was this. They said, what if this increase is simply pygmy blue whales moving south? What if the Antarctic blue whales really are gone, and all you're seeing is these smaller pygmy blue whales going south. I should point out that the scientific name for pygmy blue whale is Balanoptra musculus brevicorda, which really means the short-tailed little mouse whale, <laughs> which I kind of like. Um, so pygmy blue whales are just shorter. They're max 80 feet instead of 100 feet, practically small. Um, they go, get sexually mature at 63 feet, whereas Antarctic blue whales are sexually mature almost at the same length as the maximum length of pygmy blue whales. Um, so I had this brainwave and I said, look, if there's such different lengths, you should be able to look at the catches of whales in the Antarctic, and if they're all big, the mature females are all big, then they're probably Antarctic blue whales, and if they're all small, they'd be pygmy blue whales, and if they're kind of bimodal, like the two peaks in the distribution, then there must be partly pygmy, partly, partly Antarctic. So if you look at the top panel there, that's what you'd expect to see if 100% of them were pygmy. The bottom panel is if 0% if, uh, of pygmy, 100% are Antarctic amongst the catchers. And you can look at the catchers over time and ask if the proportion of pygmy blue whales is increasing during, during that period. Um, so we gathered all the data. We wrote a very fancy model that the reviewers forced me to turn into Bayesian as well. Um, and this is what we found. And there's some kind of interesting stuff here. Okay, first of all, top left, that's the distribution for pygmy blue whales, what you'd expect for length. The dashed line is, is the maximum length of pygmy blue whales. The bottom panels are what you see in the Antarctic in different periods. The top row is early period, the bottom row is a later period, and there's really very little difference in those distributions. And what you see is there's no, none of this bimodal, that there's no, there are no whales caught in those short lengths that are sexually mature. So there's no really very little evidence of pygmy blue whales in the Antarctic, either in the early period or in the late period. Um, I will point out a couple things, a couple other things. You see the yellow bars? Those are the number caught in, in five foot intervals. So they're re required to record them every one foot interval. Um, I think it says something about how accurate the measurements are that there's a big peak wherever there's a five foot interval, which suggests they were rounding the lengths to the nearest five feet 
okay? Another sign of how big these animals are. Like imagine if you were working in a fishery and you were satisfied to have measurements to within the nearest five foot interval for the length of your fish. Okay. So the results of that model um, suggest that 99.2% of the whales in the Antarctic were indeed Antarctic blue whales, and also that 99.9% .9 of the whales in the, the northern, more northerly part of the Indian Ocean were pygmy blue whales. So we can be pretty satisfied that they were, they were separate. The only thing that came out that was really odd was off Chile. So there, there's the distribution for the Antarctic, there's the distribution for the Indian Ocean, Antarctic blue whales, pygmy blue whales, and the distribution for Chile and yellow doesn't show at all what you'd expect. Remember, if they're half pygmy and they're half Antarctic, you'd expect to see two modes, one mode for the bigger ones and one mode for the smaller ones. What you see instead is a nice unimodal distribution exactly between the other two. Um, from which I said, well, gosh, they have a different core type, they have different genetics, they have a different size, maybe we should be calling these things a different subspecies. Um, so I wrote a paper, I even suggested a scientific name, the reviewers took it out. Um, <laughs> but the Society for Marine Mammalogy has actually recognized this as a separate unnamed subspecies. So the name is up for grabs. If you're down there and you find a blue whale, capture it and call it the type of specimen and you get to name it. Okay, there's my challenge for you. Right, but I wasn't finished. There's one more thing you can do that's kind of interesting. Kind of disgusting, but kind of interesting. Okay. In amongst all of these illegal Soviet whaling records, some of the whalers kept the original logbooks showing the true whaling numbers, stored them away in their back shed, under their toilet, in their mattress. And when the Soviet Union uh, crumbled and the Soviets admitted that they had uh, done this illegally in 1994, out came the biologists and said, you know, here are all the original whaling passports. Every whale that we caught illegally, all the biological data, the lengths, they pranked or not, where we caught them, everything. Here's the actual data. And you can replace all of the data that we reported to you, which was, uh, like we just caught two fin whales totally, like south of 40, instead of one blue whale north of 40 south. Um, and included in that were information about the ovaries of these whales. Now back in the day, we didn't know how to age whales at all. Uh, but what it turns out is that inside the ovaries, they have all these round blobs you can see. them. see the big one in the bottom left? That's what happens when a blue whale is pregnant. It produces this massive corpus luteum that produces all the pregnancy throughout a blue whale's um, uh, pregnancy, produces all the hormones throughout the blue whale's pregnancy. Um, after the pregnancy finishes, that big blob, that corpus, starts to reduce in size and you can see on the top right there's a smaller blob and you can see all the smaller blobs still that form permanent markers within the ovaries one for each time that they were pregnant or possibly one for each time they ovulated which may or may not be the same thing the point is that over time the older blue whales will accumulate more of these corpora than the younger ones so i went through all these log books um, and I have to say that going through a stack of papers like this, where each row on each page, and there were about 50 rows on each page, is one dead whale caught illegally, takes its toll. Um, but once I converted the data, this is what you get. Okay? So as length increases, the number of these corpora goes up because, of course, they have been pregnant more often. The green ones are what you see in the northern Indian Ocean. The red ones are what you see in the Antarctic. So once again, this is now a pretty late period because this is now the 50s, 60s, 70s. What you see is that in the Antarctic, there are very, very few red dots at short lengths. There are very, very few blue whales that were pregnant at very short lengths. Um, and so you can fit another model to these data, and you can ask what is the percentage in the Antarctic that were pygmies 
And the answer is 0.1%. Okay, so we've answered the question finally. I know it was kind of cool models to show you. Plus I got to talk about old well ovaries, which is kind of disgusting, but interesting. Um, so the answer is we can be pretty certain that the recovery is valid and that Antarctic blue wells are going to get there eventually and, and newer estimates already are showing signs of further recovery. Okay, what about the next population on our list? What about Chilean blue wells, this new subspecies? Well, here we have a bit less information. We don't have an abundance estimate for the whole population. We know that there's a minimum of 500 to 760 uh, uh, blue wells there. We have pretty good information on historical catches. There were about 5,000 odd. You combine those two in the same kind of model I just used, um, and you end up with the population being above 25% of pre-whaling levels. So they're nowhere near as depleted as the Antarctic blue whales. They might, in fact, be quite a bit better off, given that that's a minimum abundance estimate. Um, and by the way, an aside to this is, we wrote this paper, and my only job was to run that logistic model and plug in the numbers and get the answer. That was my, my sole job. The other people's job was to do all the hard work. So we wrote the paper, we published it, and about five years later, I got an email from one of my colleagues saying, hey, you know, I'm trying to redo your results. That's always a bad omen. <laughs> Super bad omen. Would you mind sending me your code so I can rerun them? I can send the code a couple days later. Um, I'm trying to, uh, I think I see the issue now. Okay, it's a super, super bad sign. And it turns out that, yes, if you put the brackets in the wrong place, you get the wrong answer. Okay, so I made a mistake in my R code, and every number in the paper was wrong. Okay, so you'll notice that there's a correction to this paper <laughs> um, that's out there where we had to post a correction for all the numbers in the abstract, the results, the discussion, and the figures. So let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what about close to home here? What about our nice eastern North Pacific blue well? So here we're looking, if you look in the North Pacific, we think there are two populations. There could be more, for sure, the one going from Mexico up to California, up to uh, British Columbia and occasionally into the Gulf of Alaska is one, we'll call those Northeast Pacific. The ones in the central and western part of the North Pacific, we'll call that another population. It may be more than one. Um, it's up for debate right now. So the question is, how do we get access? How do we understand what's going on? What's going on there? The biggest problem is this. We have to figure out which catches of all the catches in the North Pacific belonged to the Eastern North Pacific population as opposed to the Western and Central North Pacific population. So we did something that I thought was pretty cool. Um, we have all of these um, acoustic listening devices spread out all over the North Pacific. And at each of these places, they can hear the sounds produced by blue whales. And it turns out that each blue whale population makes a distinctive song. When I say population, what I really mean is the males. These are, you know, mansplaining a lot, okay? Because they just go over and over and <laughs> over and over and over again. And the females are just like, okay, shut up. <laughs> and they just keep on going, okay? For whatever reason, I'm not quite sure why they do it. Nobody knows why, but it's something to do with mating or something like that, you know? Um, but anyway, you can, you can look at each of those positions and you can figure out how many calls you receive from the western sound and, how many, and central sound, how many calls you receive from the eastern sound. And from that, um, so here there are the acoustic recorders, from that um, you can figure out which of them come from the east and which of them come from the west. In fact, what we did was we fit a surface saying the probability of being western is this one, the probability of being eastern is this one, and so that gives us the probability at any place in the ocean of being um, eastern versus western. So where, they, where the two cores kind of converge, that's the middle. So blue dots here are definitely eastern, 
red dots are definitely Western and the white dots are, we're not quite sure, they could be either, there's some probability of being one or the other. Um, so what we can get out of this is a whole series of possible catch time series that involves all the uncertainty and allocating the, the different um, algorithms. And there's even more uncertainty that I gloss over here that's all taken into account because my student did the work. Um, what we get out of this is this. We get a time series where red here is the Western and Central North Pacific. Blue, just think of that as being positive but negative, is the Eastern North Pacific. And the gray is we're not quite sure which ones they belong to, but we can make some probability assignment. Okay, so we had a catches. That's important. Um, we also have, so the catches are down there, the little bars down the bottom. The abundance is the, is the dots. We know what the current abundance is, somewhere around 1,500 to 2,000 odd. And we can try and fit the same kind of model to these data as we did before. And this is what we get. Some good news that our blue whales off this coast are doing pretty well according to our model. Um, and I should say that this does account for ship strikes. That's the green down the bottom. That's the estimated number of ship strikes. And what you can see is that even if you um, increase the ship strikes quite a bit, that they don't uh, come up to the same level as the historical catches um, yet. And we can do a bunch of other sensitivities. We can ask what happens if you put different priors, you add abundance estimates, you increase catches, you add uncertainty, you fit to different numbers. And all of them pretty much show the same thing, that East and North Pacific blue wells are close to being recovered, um, albeit with quite a bit of uncertainty. OK, so what about the Central and Western North Pacific population? Well, the answer is the catches are much bigger and much more recent, but we don't have any abundance estimates. So we don't know what current abundance is for the Central and Western North Pacific population. The suspicion is that they're pretty low levels. So the suspicion is they're pretty depleted. Um, and this has, this has worsened by the fact that all the recent data we have that come from um, the, 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 the color here is effort, sighting effort. The circles are where they actually saw blue whales, and this is the same Japanese scouting vessel data I showed for the, south, uh, for the southern hemisphere. What you see is none were sighted in this whole period off Japan. Um, and the suggestion has even been made that they were extirpated off Japan. But more recent data has seen substantial number of sightings off Japan again. So it doesn't seem that that's entirely true. OK. What about all these pygmy blue oil populations? Now here we have our biggest problem. We have Northern Indian Ocean, Southwestern Indian Ocean, Southeastern Indian Ocean, and Southwestern Pacific. Four populations, four different call types, and for none of them do we have any idea of how to separate the catches out. And so this is the newest piece of work I've been involved in. Um, the idea is to collect acoustic uh, recorders again. So here in each panel, the red circles are where we heard call types from that population. The X's that are black are where we did not hear them, but we listened. And you can see that they're pretty spatially segregated. Um, so you can take these data, you can fit a nice smooth model to it. And by we, I mean my student Cole Monaghan, because he does all the fancy stuff. And we get this nice surface that then says, OK, based on where each of these populations occurs from the acoustic data, we can separate the catches out the same way. If we assume that where they were when we were catching them is the same as where they are making their calls now. That's a big assumption, right? But I don't know what else we can really do. Um, so this is what you get. When you apply those data to the catches, you can see that there were actually fairly small catches off New Zealand in the, the southwest Pacific uh, population, but pretty large catches in the southwest Indian Ocean and fairly substantial catches from the Australia, Indonesia, and from the northern um, Indian Ocean population. OK, so let's circle back and say, what do we know? Take a big, deep breath. Antarctic blue whales, super bad, super depleted, but recovering. Northeast Pacific, almost completely recovered. Central, Western, North Pacific, we don't know. But lots of catches, so they're probably depleted. Chile, doing OK probably more than 26% of pre-whaling levels. 
Um, New Zealand is pretty fine because the catches are quite a bit smaller than current abundance estimates. Uh, North Indian Ocean, mm, not clear, pretty big catches, pretty uh, uh, restricted abundance estimates. Southwest Indian Ocean, huge catches, so they're probably quite depleted. Australia, probably quite depleted because of big catches. When you add up all the numbers, they're going to be something like 10,000 to 25,000 blue whales left in the world, perhaps 3 to 9 percent of pre whaling numbers. So, to put that into context, remember that one year in the Antarctic in 1931, 31,000 blue whales were caught that year. So, we still have a long way to go before full recovery. Anyway, that was a lightning blitz. Thank, thank you very much. I've got numerous co authors that I have to thank. What funding I did get was all from the International Whaling Commission, and I am open for any questions you have. Thank you. Yes? All whaling that went on before they really started whaling going out to the blue whales, is there any significant chance that the blue whale populations were affected by that, maybe even in a positive? Uh, we can speculate, but it's really hard to know. Um, most of their competitors, um, well, first of all, they weren't doing any whaling in the Antarctic, so probably not affected there. Um, most of their competitors were not that influenced by whaling. Um, so minke whales, humpbacks were, but humpbacks will often catch fish as well. So it's possible indirectly they could have been. Um, every now and again, they would try and harpoon a blue whale and, and soon realize it was a bad mistake to make. Um, but we just don't know. Um, but probably not. So it's probably all right to think of the whales one at a time or closer to that. Uh, in a modeling world or the real world? <laughs> okay, as a model, that's the simplest assumption you can make um, because we have no data or information to to create different models that have other other scenarios. Um, in reality, I don't know. Come up with a scenario and I can model it. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Yeah. Do you think carrying capacity is the same now as it was a hundred years ago? Like will the the climate change and everything with the ocean support a full recovery? I don't know. Uh, the, the problem with carrying capacity, and, it, and it's really just a, a model construct to make our life easier, um, what carrying capacity does is it ensures the population doesn't expand to infinity. And it ensures, with the rate of increase, that if population goes down to low levels, you expect it to go back up again. Um, so it's all built into the model assumptions. Um, it seems from, from whale populations where we do know more information about recovery in later periods, it seems like gray whales off the east and north Pacific, it seems that carrying capacity may well fluctuate over the years. Um, but without information to let us know how that might fluctuate or how to build that in, it's very hard to, to figure out how you would incorporate that in these kinds of models. They're the simplest possible model that you, that you, can, you can build. Um, some people like Eva Plagani um, at CSIRO in, 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 um, in Australia have, have built models that try to ask what the interactions between the species are. So if you know, blue whales go down, there's more krill available, so other species might go up. And then when those go down, then krill might go up and blue whales could go up and you know, those kind of interactions. They're pretty speculative though. Um, and sometimes the oscillations you get out of those are pretty wild. So I have my own doubts about that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Trevor, you didn't mention the North Atlantic. Yes, I never got to it. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't run any models for the North Atlantic. Um, but as soon as. I thought you had it in your slides. Yeah, I have, we have catches. Just in terms of catches. How was the last one? Yeah, there are cat we can get the catches. There are abundance estimates. I just haven't run any models for that yet. But um, oh, uh, ten thousand. Yeah, ten thousand caught. But most of those were caught um, eighteen eighty to 
Um, I can't remember exactly, but it's like in 1930s or 1940s, they really stopped whaling a long time before um, they did in the Antarctic. A lot of the countries put bans in because there were very few left. Um, there certainly are in the thousands likely left now, um, which seems to indicate that they've recovered to some extent. They certainly aren't as, as depleted as Antarctic blue whales, um, but I would, I would hazard a guess of 10 to 20%. Um, possibly more. It, a lot of it depends what you assume about increase rates. You know, if you've, had, if you've got 80 years to, re to re increase, it makes a big difference if you assume 5%, 7%, 10%. Yeah? So, now that all whaling's been banned, are there any additional management efforts currently being taken into account for blue whales? Like, is there, I mean, there's no whaling, there's essentially, essentially monitoring at this point. Yeah, it's monitoring. The, the, the big issues now are ship strikes. And so a lot, a lot of efforts, people here know about ship strikes off California, Sri Lanka, any place with heavy shipping. Um, and some estimates suggest there could be as many as 20 or 30 blue whales killed a year off the coast here by, by being hit with ships. Um, sometimes what you see is a boat will, will, will suddenly slow down um, midway through its voyage and they can't figure out why the engines aren't working properly or what's going on. And when they get to the port and they offload and the boat rises up, there's a, a whale draped over the, the bow underwater. Um, so, so that's that, and that, you know, been slowing, slowing the boat down a little bit. Um, climate change, ocean acidification, those could all affect prey. Um, blasting. Seismic blasting and could affect prey, um, and certainly could deafen the whales if they're close enough. Um, I'm sure you saw recently that the whales that they um, got off of, um, get washed up in Indonesia that had over 80 pounds of plastic in it. Yeah, it's possible that they could ingest um, plastic that could clog them up. Um, I haven't seen any blue whales with substantial plastic ingestion, but it's, it's certainly possible. There's a number of entanglement uh, issues as well. Yeah. Entanglement in fishing gear. There's also, um, every now and again in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they, they get trapped by the ice. Actually, quite a few die that way. Um, so that, there, are, there are issues, but, but none of them anywhere near the level of, of whaling um, in terms of threat. Blue whale sing, and people have seen in a lot of different populations of blue or a lot of different cult types of blue whales that the frequency is going down over time. Uh, yeah. It's suggested by John Hildebrand that that's due to recovery from whales, so the population is going up and there's some indirect effect that's making the frequency go down. Uh, have you tried to match up any of the modeling data um, to changes in frequencies? You know, you have populations that have been greatly depleted and are still increasing every year, and then other ones like New Zealand. Yeah. Now, have you tried to match those up at all? Um, yeah, that, that's a great. That's a great point. So it's a very cool uh, finding that everywhere in the world the blue whale sounds are getting deeper and deeper and deeper every year. In fact, intra season they'll they'll dip down and then go up again at the end of the season. Dip down and go up again. But each year they're going down a little bit every year, and it's true of everywhere. the The problem is we don't we don't have very good rates of increase estimates for most of these populations, and so it's a bit, little bit speculative to ask um, if there's a relationship. Yeah, but they certainly are going down off, off our coast as well, and, and blue whale numbers here have been stable by all measures for quite a while. Um, so I don't think that's entirely uh, uh, what's going on. Um, I came across a cool paper that recently, it's, it's about this new call they found called the Spot Call of Australia. We think, they think it's the right whales, and the spot call is a little bit, um, started off being a little bit higher than the Antarctic blue whale call, but every year it dropped down so quickly that it dropped down below the blue whale call, down from uh, 28 to 18 hertz, and then it jumped up back to 29 hertz again. So it's possible, and this is something that Kate Stafford uh, mentioned to me, it's possible that what we might see if we, if we wait long enough is the bluebell cores going down, 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 and then after 15 or 20 years, they jump back up and go down, down, down. I don't know. 
I mean, um, it, it's a, a, a real mystery to me. Um, I don't think it's just because of recovery. Um, and there's, there's been no really good explanation for it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure who was next. Daniel. There's a curious... The figures are great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's a curious process that I am curious about your thoughts and has to do with uh, hybridization between thin whales and blue whales. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, what the implications are for recovery or, or what's going on there uh, from a modeling perspective. And obviously, they are. Sparse, but I'm curious as to whether you have any thoughts on how you can use that to make some inferences about what recovery is like and what the uh, the impact of this hybridization may be having. Uh, for instance, in California, given that there's a lot of good effort uh, in photo ID and things like that, and the uh, hybrids are recognizable generally, uh, mm -hmm. there could be some modeling approach to try and get a handle on how much that's going on and there's some catches of hybrids in the North Atlantic. I think pretty much, at least uh, in some of the major basins, there's some evidence for hybrids. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. Now, what's really weird is the hybridization is between uh, blue whales and fin whales. And if you look at this figure, you see how far away blue whales and fin whales are on the, on the, the phylogenetic chart. And that mess in the middle that you've never seen on any phylogenetic chart before, that's, uh, that's uh, called um, introgression, I believe. It's, it's a whole bunch of like just genomes getting messed up and mixed up in the middle, okay? N evidence of not unclean uh, division between the, the different species. Um, I don't know what the implications are of bluefin hybrids. At least one of the hybrids themselves has been found pregnant. So they do seem to be viable and be able to produce offspring themselves. Yeah, oh yeah? yeah. Um, I mean, recently this has really come to the fore because the Icelandic whalers that are catching fin whales caught a whale that everybody looking at it said was a blue whale, which would be completely illegal in the first blue whale caught since 1978, um, since the Spanish did stuff illegally. Um, and, and they did genetic testing that said it was a blue fin hybrid. Um, I have heard privately from some geneticists here that they don't believe them and they would like to see the samples, but I don't know. It's the fifth one they've caught in the last 20 years. You wonder about the chain of evidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What was definitely true was the whale came up, they took pictures of themselves next to it and they quickly processed it and it disappeared. Um, there were some other hands up. Yeah. So we tagged some whales on uh, California and tracked them to the Costa Rica Dome. And when John Klamakitas went down there with us, about half the whales that he saw down there were not in his coastal California, eastern North Pacific catalog. I guess the speculation is that they would be central North Pacific blue whales, but in the same area during the breeding season. And I guess I'm we're curious about the stock status question. If they're using the same breeding area during the breeding season, is that more a, a label added to the feeding distribution of that that stock, or, or, or do you think it's really genetic separate? Um, yeah. So for for those that don't know, the Costa Rica dome is where's that beautiful figure from? From Daniel that has the Costa Rica dome on it. I just went past it. Such a pretty figure. I've got to show it again. <laughs> um, <laughs> rightly so. Oh, I, f I found this one. The top figure here. <laughs> so the Costa. Oh no, you can't even really see it. In the top left, there's a little pink circle. It's called the Costa Rica dome. So it's really close to uh, really close to the junk to, to Central America so the junction between North and South America just north of zero the, the equator the equator line um, I don't think those missing blue wells in the Costa Rica dome are southern hemisphere Chilean slash Peruvian blue wells I think that there are just blue wells that maybe go to BC or Gulf of Alaska or somewhere else that don't pass through California um, 
because the, I believe those have not been matched to the Chilean population either. I believe that they I have been matched. I'm suggesting they're from the southern hemisphere. I was just wondering yeah. if, if they're humane, if, the, if the, what, what we're looking at in terms of feeding distribution of western, central, and eastern, north Pacific, maybe these are central animals that don't get photographed very often, and I'm just wondering whether they, just because they're in a different foraging area, it doesn't necessarily mean they're a different reproductive stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, anything is possible, as we know from any biological experiment you've tried to ever do. Um, my feeling is no, because there haven't been any, any acoustic recordings of the western central song type down there. It's all been east and north Pacific song types down there. Um, so I can't rule it out, but I, I don't think so. Um, my suspicion is that if we really were able to tag blue whales from everywhere we, we found them, that they would go a lot of places we're not looking at right now. Um, and I suspect there's a lot more geographic structure amongst the populations. A bit like with gray whales, where we're always like, oh, the, the western North Pacific population in Kamchatka is a totally different, very rare population. And then we tracked them and found they actually go down to California and Mexico just with all the other ones. Um, and they're not actually separated by the, the middle of the, the North Pacific. Um, so it, it, there could well be bigger surprises if we were able to get satellite tags on those Costa Rica dome animals that, um, that don't match the, the ones from John's catalog. Um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think that they're, that they're from another population. Yeah. So the stock differences in the North Pacific are based primarily on vocalizations? Yes, there are two lines of evidence. The one is vocalizations. The other one is the length frequencies of mature females from the catches. Um, and they have about a meet, one meter difference uh, uh, west, uh, from the western and the eastern populations as well. So there is, does seem to be a biological difference as well with a pretty uh, uh, clear distinction as you go from the, the ones that were caught in areas where we now hear western central sounds and the ones that were caught in areas we now hear eastern north pacific sounds. So there does seem to be a biological basis as well. Um, what's a little more confusing is we don't know what's happening off Japan if that was a third population that's mostly uh, uh, been extirpated. Uh, we also, there's also suggestions of another sound uh, off Japan that might indicate a separate population there, which is why I kind of glossed over the idea of a central, western, north Pacific population. Just a point of curiosity, what's the evidence that only males make those vocalizations? That we've only heard males make those vocalizations. How do we know they're males? Um, uh, uh, biopsies where you take a biopsy from the whale at the same time you put a suction cup on them. So you can hear them singing, and you, you have the, the sex, and known sex animals. And fin whales do that. Fin whales are the same. Humpbacks are the same. I'm out of my range now. Gray whales. I think all, all the whales we have information from, it's the males that do the, the boring mansplaining. <laughs> um, all, all, of the, all of them make feeding sounds as well. OK. Fin whales for sure, blue whales for sure. I mean, it's possible we'll find out differently, but it's so far the songs are only made by the by the males. Yeah. What? Suctions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we might be wrong. So I didn't mean to dis smells, but <laughs> but I'm droning on here just like a male blue whale. Yes. I want to know what your suggested new name was for the. <laughs> oh, what would you call it? <laughs> How much are you gonna pay me? <laughs> I was gonna call them chilensis. I don't know who the reviewer was. It might have been Bob who nixed it, actually. Yeah, it's possible. I think I forget who the reviewers were. He was like, you don't have a, a type specimen, you can't name it. It's a fair point. <laughs> so, 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 so,
since Trevor has uh, literally like 25 minutes to kind of rethink and gear back up and change topics completely, uh, can we say